Hello, everyone. This is the 12th and final episode in my ongoing YouTube series that I began a few weeks ago with the broad topic of ideas and views of death, afterlife, and the future in the ancient Western world. So even though I limit it by ancient Western, it's still vast, and no one could cover it even in 100 episodes. So I've only offered a brief survey. So what I want to talk to you about in this final 12th episode is what I would call the problem Christianity never solved. And I think it's unsolvable. And that is, how do you go from the first century, earliest Christianity, the Gospels, the Jesus movement, John the Baptist, Paul, the book of Revelation, and move into the second, third, fourth, and fifth centuries and deal with the idea of death, afterlife, and the future. As we'll see, it's a real conundrum. Now, before I dive into it, I want to mention a couple of other things. First of all, this is the final episode of this limited series on ancient Western views. But as I've mentioned previously, I do want to do two more that won't be the ancient Western views of death and afterlife, but modern scientific ideas of death and afterlife. Everything from the brain and consciousness and AI and near-death experiences and that sort of thing, and what science might tell us about death and afterlife. But officially, it's not part of this ancient Western world series. But before we dive into that topic in detail, I want to share the screen. And here is my YouTube channel. And if we scroll back, we can see here the contents. Uh, let's see, June 26, I started. It's got 223,000 plus views. I, I just can't believe the interest. Ancient Hebrew views. And then we did Ancient Babylonian, Homer to Plato. This was not part of the 12 episodes, but it was about an archaeological artifact. More details that I discussed in Homer to Plato. Ancient Egyptian, Hebrew Revolution, when things really begin to change in the Hebrew Bible, uh, the origins of the idea of bodily resurrection. Uh, this was on resurrection is not resuscitation, trying to get into the differences between an immortal soul and the idea of resurrection of the body. Uh, Jesus' empty tomb. A question, do Christians follow Plato rather than Jesus or Paul when it comes to death and afterlife? And then we have loose ends and caveats where I pick up on some leftovers, you might say, in looking at the biblical material. And then I did a survey last time, a kind of recap of the biblical material, what the Bible really says about death, afterlife, and the future. And in this episode and in the first one, I want to mention that I offer free of charge a PDF file you can download, and it's a chapter of a book in which I first published this article, What the Bible Really Says About the Future. And you can have that to study and take away uh, with you. So let me go back. And I want to go to my blog before we delve into the topic. Um, I want to mention this Tabor bookshelf. This is the homepage, jamestabor.com. You see up at the top. Because here I've begun to review books and just little limited reviews and endorsements. Books that I own, I've read, and I love. And I'm going to have a lot of the authors in the future to talk about these very books. But I wanted to get started on it. So I've begun listing things. This one, as you can see here, let me make it a little larger, um, is called What the Bible Really Says About. And that's where my article appears. And there's another link to the article. And that was done way back in 1989 
edited by the late great Morton Smith and then Joseph Hoffman, who's still with us, thankfully, doing some great work. And it's a topical, popular book, but still in print, you can get it. But the main reason I wanted to show this page was this. If you want to talk about death and afterlife in the ancient world, and let me enlarge that as well, where you can see it really easily, you want to consider buying Alan Siegel, Life After Death, A History of Afterlife in Western Religions. So there's the link. It's almost 900 pages. Alan Siegel was a good personal friend of mine, as well as a colleague in the field. And I reviewed some of his books and so forth. But this one is the magnum opus. Not only his magnum opus, but if you're going to talk about afterlife, not just in the ancient world, but in the Western world of religion and philosophy, this is the book. It's an amazing book. I highly recommend it. So let me go back to my homepage. Um, I post two to three times on my blog, jamestabor.com. I got a lot of stuff coming down the pike. I don't want to overwhelm people. But if you put your email address right here, sign up for notifications, you'll get an email every time something's posted. It's not intrusive. You can quickly skip it or delete it. But you know, it helps you keep up. I can't keep up with all the things I try to follow. And this, uh, if you put your name and your email here, it's a newsletter that I publish always every month, sometimes if there's some breaking news, more than every month. And I never share emails, either this list or this list, completely confidential, never use them for any other purposes don't pass them along or anything like that. So you don't have to worry. Some people don't like to give out their emails. It's only to me. And you'll get uh, the latest and all kinds of things going on. And then my Patreon, it's really not a fundraiser as much as a segregator. In other words, you can be part of this for as low as, I think it's $5 a month. I just want to get people together who want to get together and discuss my work and my research and early Christianity in general and ancient Judaism and all the things that I do, especially the archaeology. So with the patrons, we have a monthly Zoom meeting. We talk about all kinds of things having to do with the latest research and what's going on, and we share results that are pre-publication. And uh, it's just a way of you can't put everything out publicly, and the internet is a crazy wild world, to say the least. So let me now go. This is a Catholic website. You know, we're talking in this episode about uh, later Christian views of death, afterlife, and the future. What is the resurrection of the body? Now, why would you say of the body? Because this is the problem early Christianity had. Jesus, according to the Gospels, not Mark, but according to Matthew, Luke, and John, comes out of the tomb in a physical body and even says to his disciples, look, I'm flesh and bones. I'm not a spirit. I'm a physical body. Now, that was a huge problem for the early Christians, because what they did is they didn't just go with the word body, like you find in the New Testament. Some of you know who viewed previous episodes, Paul talks about a resurrection body, but here was the problem. If Jesus came out of the tomb, flesh and bones, and I would say flesh and blood. Some people make a big deal about the blood. But the point is, he's a physical being with wounds and all, internal organs. He's living and eating and drinking on earth as a real person come back from the dead. And Christians want to make Jesus the model for the future resurrection. What are they going to do? 
so it's one thing to talk about the body, but look at this. This is standard Catholic doctrine. Christians not only believe in the survival of the soul, which is questionable in terms of the Hebrew Bible. Remember the nephesh, the living breather? That's the word soul in Hebrew. But also in the resurrection of the body. And this is Plato. This is supposedly Judaism. I'm trying to combine these two. We believe that humans are creatures composed of body and soul. Well, that could be the case. I mean, people breathe and they have a body, if you're going by the Hebrew view. These elements are separated at death. Yes, you quit breathing. But this says the soul like it's a thing. This is Plato, not the Bible. If you haven't gotten this yet and listened to the other episodes, don't be confused. Just bear with me because I'm kind of summarizing here. It is the last episode of the series. The soul is sundered from the body. And so human life can't continue, meaning bodily life. But the day will come when the soul and body are reunited. So this is Plato plus resurrection of the body combined. But look at this. I want to highlight it. People don't always get this straight today because of the problem that we're going to talk about in this episode. The Apostles' Creed has a line in it that we believe not just in resurrection, but the resurrection of the flesh. And the Greek word is sarx, and the Latin word, you know, carnes or carnal, it means flesh. The resurrection of the flesh. In other words, the dead, if Christ came back, or Jesus, let's call him, in a physical flesh and bone body with wounds and all, and he ascended to heaven visibly, according to the book of Acts and the end of the Gospel of Luke, by some manuscripts, by the way. All of them don't have his ascension. But anyway, it's certainly in the book of Acts that he ascends to heaven in his body. Uh, the word isn't just body, it's flesh. And flesh means flesh for the early Christians. And this becomes the problem. In the creed, it means the meat that hangs on our bones. Back in 1274, it took this long for a church council to really make it clear. Even though the early creeds of the third and fourth centuries say not only resurrection of the body, but resurrection of the flesh. So the Council of Lyon stated clearly we believe in the true resurrection of this flesh that we now possess. Imagine that. Now we're in the Middle Ages, but it's in the early creeds as well. Resurrection of the flesh. This flesh will rise. It won't be something else or somebody else's. It will be this flesh and we will love it as our own. Now, that's obviously unscientific. It's theological, but it's not a metaphor. It's very clear if you read the literature. And the reason is because, notice, when Jesus rose again, he rose in the body his mother had birthed. So even if you get scientific and say, wait, 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 the cells of our body fall off every day by the hundreds of millions. Our hair falls out. People can even lose limbs, God forbid, and organs and so forth and, you know, still function and not die. But according to this, that very body will rise. So it has nothing to do with the scientific change of cells or anything like that. Uh, ancient people didn't know about that. The body that had been crucified, he still had his wounds but they no longer hobbled him. So it's an enhanced fleshly body, but it is flesh. Christian poets say he wore his scars like jewels, the trophies of victory. The flesh is the hinge of salvation. So said one of the early Christians. And the catechism says, we believe in God who is creator of the flesh. And we believe in the word of God who's made flesh in order to redeem the flesh 
We believe in the resurrection of the flesh, the fulfillment of both the creation and redemption of the flesh. Isn't that amazing? Lots of Christians don't know that. They don't know they're supposed to believe that. Uh, I say supposed to believe because a lot of people believe whatever they want to believe. But, I mean, 99% of Christians, if they believe in life after death, they hope and believe that by the grace of Christ, their souls will leave their body, their body will go back to the dust, so it's partly the Hebrew view, and they will be with Christ forever and have eternal life. If you ask, well, what about the resurrected the dead? Oh, yeah, at the end of time, well, your body kind of unites with your soul or something like that, but it's not clear to people. It's mainly mentioned at graveside services, but in funeral services, the ones I've been to over the years, people almost always talk about, dear George has departed and don't mourn for him. He's with Christ. And it's presented like the death of Socrates, that you're going to a better place. You're leaving this lower world. The world is not your home. You don't belong here. The flesh is inferior, material, corrupted, and weak. And the spirit is eternal and immortal, and it goes back to God. None of that is proper Christian doctrine. I know it doesn't matter to people, but I want to talk about why this became such a problem. I'll go on. This is just a catechetical summary. You can find it. Uh, let's see. It was uh, lacatholics.org. I just Googled it, and it popped up. On the last day, we will rise with our bodies now glorified. We believe not just in the survival of the soul, that's Plato, but the resurrection of the body. We were created to live forever and find peace and satisfaction in a way that is fully human in both flesh and spirit. We are made for this and nothing else will do. The promise of Easter is the promise of such a resolution in life such fulfillment in God's presence forever. Okay, now, let me go to, I'm going to stop the share, and I'm going to go to another document. The great Bishop Augustine, who wrote this amazing magnum opus of his called The City of God, that basically sets the foundations of Christian theology for the next thousand years. So here in Augustine's great work, City of God, in which he sets the foundations for Christian theology, in book 22 at the end, he addresses the problems of resurrection over against a Hellenistic Greco-Roman essentially Neoplatonic philosophical worldview. And that is why in the world would you even talk about resurrection of the dead, especially if you mean resurrection of the flesh. So here in chapter 12, he brings up some of the ridicule that so-called pagan unbelievers would throw onto the Christians. How could you believe such a ridiculous thing? And then he asks all these questions. If there's to be equality, what about the abortions? They're small and tiny. Are they going to be equal in statue or strength? And then children that have died in childhood, they're not five or six feet tall. Uh, what's going to happen to them? They're going to be like little resurrected people. And he goes on to raise all of these questions and he says, look, you're all going to be made like Christ. So you'll all be 33 years old, fully grown, in a fleshly body, but it will be a mortal flesh. <laughs> this is almost funny. I mean, almost. It is funny. Uh, well, what about uh, fatness and leanness? And if you were bald, it's all going to be put back right. Okay. So let's go on. Here's the whole thing on abortions. 
if they are numbered among the dead, will they have part in the resurrection? And he thinks that they will be. Uh, they will attain resurrection. Uh, what about infants? When they rise in the body which they had, will they be grown up? And he says they will be grown up. Uh, will they rise in this as the same size as the Lord's body? I mean, you can see that he's taking this very, very literally. Um, then he goes on. Uh, you got. You can get this online. You got to read it. What about male and female? Well, he's forced himself into this position. If Jesus was raised in the flesh, wounds and all, as we say, then he's male. I'm not going to get more explicit than that. You figure it out. But if a woman is raised, she'll be female. And he goes on to take this very fundamentalist uh, approach that, you know, she's made from a rib of Adam and so forth. So women will be women, but they won't have any carnal thoughts, he says. They won't be trying to have sexual intercourse. And he makes the point that when Jesus is asked about resurrection, he says they won't marry or give in marriage, but he doesn't say they won't be male or female. Now, Paul, on the other hand, I believe has a, several phrases about you won't be male or female. So you'll be like Christ. I'm just going to go on through here. What about bodily blemishes? They'll get removed. Uh, everyone will be as beautiful as possible, I guess. Any kind of deformities. Uh, even if your body is disintegrated, you know, like when you die, it goes back to the dust. He gets into cannibalism. Like if people are eaten by other people or by fish in the ocean, he actually says that it'll all be brought back. I guess the very elements are atoms. God can do anything. So if you're playing in this kind of world, God will bring it all back. It will be you. If you had some kind of a deformity, it'll be worked out. There'll be symmetrical uh, and then he talks about the spiritual body. So he knows because of Paul, it has to be an incorruptible body. But what he comes up with is this idea, and Paul never says it's flesh. See, this is his problem. And we'll talk about why is this such a crazy problem for these very brilliant theologians in the third, fourth, and fifth century. Uh, but he, he says that there's still going to be in the flesh and the spiritual body means a spiritual fleshly body but it'll be incorruptible flesh so the flesh becomes incorruptible just like if adam and eve had eaten the tree of life i guess they would be eternally alive uh but in their physical bodies and then he, let, just look at these headings. He goes into all these things. It's unbelievable. I remember he does cannibalism. He does abortions. We've covered that. So let me stop the share. And I want to go to one other thing. And that is an article by Paula Fredrickson. Um this is in a Festschrift, which is a tribute volume to Karl Fried Frulich on his 60th birthday. It was published by Erdmans, 1991. If you want to do a screenshot of that, Mark Burroughs and Paul Roram were the editors. And so Paula has an article in this volume called Vile Bodies, Paul and Augustine on the Resurrection of the Flesh. And I want us to read this first paragraph. The body that you gave breakfast to this morning, the body that helped you navigate your automobile, the body with which you at this moment occupy your chair, is, according to Augustine, this very same body that will dwell in the heavens and see God. This is an extraordinary claim. It was scarcely coherent, 
and it was certainly unscientific when he presented it in AD 428 in the closing book of the City of God, which we just looked at. And he was scarcely helped in formulating it by having to base his position on an exegesis of Paul, mainly 1 Corinthians 15, 50, flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom. So he's got a real problem because Paul's view of resurrection is not flesh and blood. And yet in Luke 24, Jesus appears flesh and blood and bones and says, I'm not a ghost. I'm not an apparition. Do you have any fish to eat? This is the problem these early Christian theologians had. Now, I highly recommend the article because it's about how Augustine struggled with Paul. And we've covered Paul in this series in quite a bit of detail. And I think you can see why he would struggle with Paul. But here's why he was bound and determined to take this position that scientifically and logically seems to be pretty far-fetched. And notice I didn't say ridiculous, but hey, far-fetched. And that is that in the future resurrection for all eternity, humans will still live in their fleshly bodies, their body of flesh, the flesh itself will be raised from the dead, but it will be incorruptible and eternal. Now, that's different from transformed, from a cocoon, the example I gave with Paul. That's totally different because then you would raise a cocoon and you would still be a cocoon in your cocoon body. But the butterfly is not a cocoon and comes out of the cocoon, just the analogy again that we used before. Paul uses quite a few analogies in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, why did they have this problem? Why can't they just go with Paul? Let me back up a minute here and talk about origin, okay? O-R-I-G-E-N, origin, the great theologian of the third century, from Alexandria, Egypt, because he had argued more in the line of Paul, although he mixed a lot of his Platonism in, and it's pretty complicated, that the body would be the same body. He did believe that, that all the cells of the body would be brought together. So they will be you, but it'll be fundamentally transformed into what Paul even calls a spiritual body, and it won't be flesh. And he was condemned later by the church councils and by various of his opponents for a number of things. But one of the things is that he denied the resurrection of the flesh itself. So Augustine's idea triumphed and became the doctrine of the Christian church. But I want to say here, Shh, don't tell them, because 99% of Christians think of their soul and death and dying and going to heaven. And if you ask them about, well, what about the resurrection body? They'll probably talk about, well, it's some kind of a spiritual body, but nobody dwells on it. Christianity was totally Platonized. I mean, by all popular versions. But Augustine, even though he shares so many Platonic assumptions, and Origen does as well, they have to use Paul. But if they use Paul, they've also got the Gospels. Now, if you followed what I've covered so far in this series, you're going to see the problem right away. Immortal soul and resurrection of the body are not the same, okay? And even putting an immortal soul back into a resurrection body is not the problem, but it's not the same. So Jesus has been transformed into an immortal heavenly life, what 
what the theologians call a spiritual body, but it's a spiritual body of flesh. And as the flesh has been immortalized, it's still a physical body. They're still male and female. You're still going to have eyes and nose and ears and mouth and fingernails and everything. And you'll look like you did at age 33. Now, some people would go for that, I guess. I never hear it talked about in churches. And growing up, in going to evangelical churches, I never heard that talked about. I guess technically it's out there that, you know, that resurrection is resurrection of the flesh. And all the mainstream churches quote the Nicene Creed and the Chalcedon Creed, which all talk about the resurrection of the flesh. So what's the problem? The problem, as Paula Fredrickson says, is it's just kind of unscientific and doesn't make any sense to resurrect the flesh. And I don't care if Augustine wants to discuss, well, what about cannibals? They eat people. How are you going to get the flesh back? God can do anything if you believe in this kind of world. Okay, so that's not the problem. The problem is that the gospel accounts present Jesus and the empty tomb as the same flesh and blood body coming out of the tomb, okay? And if the same body came out of the tomb that was buried, then it's a literal bodily resurrection of the flesh. And it has to be the same body that he had his whole life. That's fundamental bedrock evangelical orthodox christianity but i've tried to demonstrate in this series that is not what paul believed that is not what paul argues and if paul is our earliest witness to resurrection of the dead that's not the fundamental teaching of early christianity what paul presents is so clear in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, that those who are living will rise to meet the Lord and they'll be transformed into this new glorious state. And those who are dead will be raised incorruptible, not their flesh, which is long gone, even those lost at the sea, which Augustine says all of that will be put back together. But a spiritual body. So I hear people today still arguing somehow as a holdover maybe from this ancient Christian idea of the third, fourth, and fifth centuries, that resurrection of the dead and a new spiritual body means the same body. But if you take a different approach to the empty tomb, and you begin to see resurrection of the dead in Paul. And it's the earliest view, as I've emphasized, and it's also the only first person witness to the resurrection. Paul says in the first person, I have seen the Lord. And then when you ask him, what did you see? He doesn't say, well, a physical body, you know, just like our body. In fact, I had a meal with him. He doesn't say that. He says, I can't describe to you the body. Uh, God will give those resurrected a body suitable for that new heavenly existence, just as Jesus sits metaphorically at the right hand of God. So do you see the problem? When you try to put Paul with the Gospels, you talk about static and friction and a complete in compatibility it can't work but both of these things are in the new testament so it has to work and so you have augustine coming up with the position that it will be the same flesh the same flesh not just flesh but the same flesh but then perfected into what you would be at age 33 but you're not mortal anymore and you're not subject to the desires of the flesh anymore because your spirit has been transformed, but you're still in the same body. Think about it. It's a good ending to the episode. Uh, I think if we go back and do the historian's work, let me state it like this. 
the earliest view of resurrection of the dead and Jesus's resurrection is a combination of Daniel 12, many of those who sleep in the dust will arise and they will shine like the stars forever. And Paul's view of resurrection, I've seen the Lord, well, what kind of a body? And he says, well, God knows, only God can create this glorious, magnificent body. And he uses the term metamorphosis. So the cocoon is not the butterfly. The buried, corruptible body of flesh is not the resurrected body. I don't think Origen, the third century theologian, had everything worked out. But he tried to do an exegesis of Paul. And he did say that the spiritual body would not be the body of flesh, that somehow it would be transformed. So I'll wrap this up with that and leave you with those thoughts. And if you haven't watched all of the episodes, I hope you'll go back and watch all 12. I think everything will come together and culminate in what I just presented. Take care, everyone. See you next time.